Is everyone ready to make a start this morning here? <coughs> we have a lot uh, that we're going to present today, and we also have, uh, we also have a bit of, of interaction that will be going on today. So, so it won't be all just sitting and listening, but a part of the time will be spent working in, in small groups and, and working one-on-one -on -one and doing some things. But before we <coughs> really get into the meat and potatoes, uh, I, I said to Stephen as we were putting this together, I said, I really think we need to give people a little bit of background. Why we're doing what we're doing? Where does this come from? What is the sort of, uh, what is the vision for, um, for Engage? Uh, something that we've put together uh, a number of months ago and have been working towards actually for quite a few years. But the question, why Engage? And if I asked you why you're here, you're obviously here because you're concerned about youth. You want youth in the church. And I don't need to persuade you of the importance of ministering to teenagers, because if I needed to, then you, we'd be somewhere else. You wouldn't be in this room. So it's quite simple there. But <clears throat> to really simplify it, uh, we need a church for all generations. And we need a church with all generations. Um, that really is the crux of you know, the concern when we talk about the need for youth ministry, children's ministry, whatever age group in the church is missing, we look and go, wait a minute, we've got a problem. Or when we look at congregations that are aging and there's nobody under 40 years old or something, we look and say, we don't have a future. So the real you know, pressing reality, why engage? Because we, we uh, want to have a church for all generations. Uh, we want to have a church with all generations. So it's not just suitable for all generations, but that all generations are there. And, and if that phrase, all generations, sticks in your head today, or every generation sticks in your head today, that would be a really, really good thing. So just give you sort of a little heads up. Well, the good news is that God has a plan for having a church with all generations. It's found in Scripture in a number of different places, and I'm just going to highlight two of them to you. One is in Psalm 78, where, uh, where verse 4 specifically says, We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. The, the Psalm 78, uh, the people are being told off. They're being sort of scolded for the fact that, uh, that this has not happened that the faith has not been passed from one generation to the next, that people uh, growing up are not hearing about the incredible things of the Lord, and so they grow up as a faithless generation and a rebellious generation. And so the warning in Psalm 78 is if we continue like that, if we don't pass this on, then we will have a wicked and rebellious generation, and they cite like such and such event. You know, previous generations before have done that, where the sons and daughters of God's people had forgotten about the Lord. So Psalm 78 is kind of a warning and it's a real directive. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will pass them on. We'll tell the next generation about the incredible things of God. And then another one <clears throat> from Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, a section that's known uh, as to, to the Hebrew people is known as the Shema, something that was recited on a regular basis. And it's part of uh, where, where it comes out of or gets to is verses 6 to 9. And these words that I command you, it's not the directly the Shema starts with verse 4, but these words that I command you shall be on your heart. That is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, that sort of thing. Um, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them dil diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Uh, it, do you get this sense that this is supposed to be going on? God's instruction for his people is you pass the faith on by sharing the truth of God with the next generation. This happens in the family. Parents are supposed to do this. The church is a family. The church is supposed to do this um, with the next generation. So God has a plan for passing the faith from one generation to the next. And that plan, uh, when done correctly, means that we have a church that is for all generations and a church that is uh, with all generations. So engage, this idea of engage, this uh, initiative that we've put together, uh, is what, what we're going to do today is offer a simple, sustainable model for ministry. And, and it's really key, I hope that you grasp, that it needs to be simple so that anybody can do it. It needs to be sustainable so that it isn't something that just gets started and then uh, drifts away. 
Uh, my background in South Carolina, I've been there for 13 and a half years, and I've worked with a lot of small parishes that couldn't afford to hire a youth minister. We have a lot of churches that do have youth ministers paid, but we have a lot of churches that have struggled to do anything with youth work. They have a couple of teenagers, they're not sure what to do with them, and they, and they try to get something going, and it doesn't last very long. And I was helping them to get things going, and then watching that it would just sort of drift off to nothing, and then there isn't anything happening, and I'm going, oh, this is frustrating. And so I realized that we need a simple, sustainable model for ministry. So in, in putting together a simple, sustainable model for ministry, we decided we wanted to start in scripture rather than in youth culture. In other words, we want to start with what God wants for teenagers rather than what the youth thinks tell us that they want. We're not looking to meet sort of their need for entertainment. We're looking to, provide, to do what God tells us to do with teenagers. Um, it's based on, on bare essentials of passing our faith to others. We really looked at what does it take to pass the faith from one generation to the next. And what are, what are the, just the bare essentials, and let's build on that. Um, it's equally effective. The model that we're going to put in front of you is equally effective for evangelism and discipleship. So this isn't just discipling teenagers. It's also something that we can do to evangelize. It's a way to share the faith as well as pass the faith on, as well as help people grow deeper in their faith. And it is relationally driven rather than being program driven. That's the part about, about it that's, that's the sustainability issue. What I kept finding with churches that I was going to and meeting with their vestries and meeting with youth leaders is they would get somebody that would run a youth group for a, a year or two, and then it would drift off. It was a program that they were trying to put on, and they couldn't sustain a program. They didn't have the people resources. They didn't have the money resources, that kind of thing. And so we're looking and saying, no program. Don't need a program. We need relationships. It's relationally driven. It's not program driven. <clears throat> The model is so simple, and this is, this is my big boast for the day. The model is so simple that it can serve the needs of every generation. That is what we are teaching to do with teenagers can be done with any, any age group. Uh, it will work in churches of any size or context, rural or urban, um, tiny or, or large, it doesn't make any difference. We'll uh, start, it, we can get it started without adding any programs. Don't ever need to add programs to do what we're putting forward to you today. Uh, it will equip people to grow in their faith, and it will fulfill God's plan for the church. That is the propagation of the gospel, the, the Great Commission. It is a Great Commission sort of plan. Engage has no need for extensive resources. You don't need space. You don't need stuff. You need uh, time spent with young people. That's what we're putting forward is it's just time spent with young people. You don't need a big budget. You don't need all this sort of stuff. It doesn't need critical mass. And, and this one is one that I find a lot of folks got hung up on in uh, small churches trying to do a youth group. If you only got a couple of teenagers that show up, then they, for a youth group, they kind of go, well, youth groups down the street are much bigger, and we don't really have very many kids, and so it, it doesn't really feel like it's worth doing. And, and people give up real easily. And what we're putting forward has no critical mass need. You don't need to have a certain number to make it work. Um, it's one-on-one -on -one or it's small groups. And there's no need for, well, if you don't have 20 kids, they just aren't going to come because they feel like it's not cool enough. You know, there's not that sort of thing. So critical mass is just out the door, which is a great thing. Um, and it has no need for programs. As I said, it's relationships. We're not starting programs. We're, we're putting forward to you the idea that it's about building relationships. And we don't need to attract teens. Rather than saying, hey, come to our stuff, we're saying, no, we're not going to bother with that with this model. We're going to go out to where teenagers are and meet them there and, and not worry about getting them to come to us. I mean, ideally, we're trying to connect teenagers to the church. We want them to come to church on Sunday mornings and worship with us. That's, that's not what I'm talking about in terms of how we're reaching out to them, go to them, build relationships with them. We're going to talk about that. And, uh, and talk about how to, how to work one-on-one -on -one and in small groups with teenagers. But it's not about attracting them. It's about reaching out to them. It's about going to where they're at. The model is simple. We're going to talk to you about talk, study, pray. And if you were at the uh, convention, you heard that phrase. You've seen, you know, seen the look, uh, heard things about it, and you'll hear more about that will all get unpacked today, what that means. But I really want you to understand that Engage is founded on some core assumptions. 
there are some things that underlie why we've put this model forward that come from years and years of experience of working with churches and working with teenagers. Uh, one, the really obvious, people need to connect. We are made and wired for relationships. And when people don't have relationships in their lives, they have all kinds of problems. I mean, life gets really bad. Uh, teenagers are people. They need relationships. They need to connect. And the, the world of social media is a virtual relationship world. It's not real. It's not, it's not deeply fulfilling like real human relationships are. So that creates an opportunity, but it's really important. Teenagers, uh, like anybody, are people who need to connect. Another core assumption is that how people start is how they continue. How people start is how they continue. I first heard this phrase from a friend of mine at a large church who said, what we win people with, we win them to. Uh, the idea is, is that somebody comes to faith in a particular program or a particular uh, event or something or other, and they don't have a background of like, you know, I'm going to church all their lives or something or other, and they come to faith, where they're going to look to continue on in that faith is gonna be something that looks like where they started. So somebody, for example, if, if, they, if they didn't grow up in the church and they went to Curcio and they came to faith in Curcio, what kind of church are they going to look for um, if, if when they decide, oh, I should go to church on Sunday mornings? They're going to look for a church that sings the songs and feels like Curcio. It's just a natural. Now, we all can figure out, can think of ex, uh, exceptions to this norm, but the norm is how people start is how they continue. So that... When we think about that, we have to think really carefully. We need a model of, for ministry that is appropriate for all ages, not just something that's going to work when somebody's at a certain age. We need, we need to be doing it in such a way that it will carry on. <clears throat> Another core assumption, scripture is our primary source for growing in our knowledge of God. The very first psalm, Psalm 1, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And the psalmist is saying, is his delight is on God's word. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does prospers. And the psalm goes on to contrast that with the opposite. And, and Psalm 1 really opens up all of understanding the Psalms. It's rooted in scripture. It's rooted in the Bible because the Bible is the way people primarily grow. That's how we grow in our faith. There's other things that help us along the way, but our growing in the knowledge of God is from scripture because that is our source for knowing who he is. And if we don't know who God is and know all sorts of things about him, we can't have a good relationship with him. I've been married 28 years, and if I didn't take the time to get to know my wife, those would be 28 nightmarish years. It would be horrible to be married 28 years to somebody you didn't know. Well, I've took the time to get to know her. We have a great relationship as a result, obviously, 28 years into it. So um, scripture is our primary source for growing in our knowledge of God. And the, and the other core assumption is that Bible study is incomplete unless we put it into action. Bible study is incomplete unless we put it into action. And James chapter 1, you should be familiar with, uh, with this passage, um, where he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word does not, but does not do what he says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediate forgets, immediately forgets what he looks like. But anyone who, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So, you know, we'll talk a lot about studying the Bible today. And I want you to, when you hear us talk about studying the Bible, don't think we're just looking to fill people's heads with knowledge that no, goes nowhere. It, Bible study is never complete unless there's application to it. We have not studied and learned scripture unless we are living it out. It, it's, just, it's just not... Uh, it's not just, it's not head knowledge only. Well, who can engage? Who is it that can be plugged in uh, to be engaging with teenagers 
and obviously you all are here because you want to, but you may be also here because you want to find other people who will do this with you. And we basically want to suggest to you that anyone who loves God, loves God's word, and loves people is, is the sort of person that we want to see engaging with teenagers. And, and the litmus, litmus test, I want to say, on loves people is when we look at folks and they have good peer relationships, then I would trust them to put them working with a teenager. But somebody who doesn't have good peer relationships, who does not have social skills, is probably not somebody that I would put fits that third description. Um, those who love God, are they growing in their faith? Is their faith seeming to be vibrant? Is it developing? That kind of thing. Or do they seem totally dead? That loves God, is there a passion there? Um, you know, that sort of thing. Loves his word, are they people who read this thing regularly? And then, what is the long-term impact of Engage? In other words, if you put this simple, sustainable model into your parish um, and into the diocese, and it, it permeates all over the place, what happens down the road, not just for those teenagers that are reached in the next couple of years? Those who are leaders in Engage <clears throat> will develop a particular set of skills. Um, I go all Liam, Liam Neeson in my head at that point. Um, <laughs> develop a, a particular set of skills that are how do you build a relationship with somebody who's not your age and open up the Bible with them and read that and study it and figure out how do we apply it to our lives and pray together and, and really nurture somebody along in the faith. Somebody who does that with teenagers for a number of years might kind of go, you know, I've been doing this with youth for a while. I think I want to do that with my peers. I think I want to do that with another age group. Or I'm looking and going, you know, we've got a bunch of teenagers around now, but we don't have as many children. Maybe I need to do that with children. There's a particular set of skills that are useful across the whole church. <clears throat> those who grow up that have been discipled by those older than them will be able to disciple those younger than them. And is a natural sort of thing to do. That when that was your way of growing up, when that was how you started, that's how you will continue and you will do for others what was done for you. Families then will know what to do to pass the faith to the next generation. We will be able to, to complete, fulfill Deuteronomy 6 and Psalm 78. We'll be able to be faithful to those, to those commands, those instructions. Because moms and dads will no longer be sitting and going, Jay, I don't know what to do to talk to my kid about God. Well, if they grew up as a teenager, somebody reached out to them, spent time with them, opened the Bible with them, kind of go, oh, I guess I just do what I've been doing all along with other people. I'll open up the Bible with my kids and I'll share my faith with my children. So it, it, it enables us to then uh, follow that. And ultimately, every congregation is engaging every generation. That's where it all ends up. Every congregation is engaging every generation. Our starting point for today is engaging youth, engaging young people, teenagers, young adults, that sort of thing. Um, but ultimately, every congregation will be engaging every generation. That's where I'm going for today.